Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining me today. I'm Kyle Kerwin, the CEO and co-founder at BigEye, and I'm here to talk to you about defining reliability uh, with SLAs for data platform teams. So before we get into talking about SLAs for data, why, why SLAs? Why are we talking about SLAs in the first place? Well, let's start out with uh, a story about a data platform team. So uh, this is a data platform team that, like in many companies, uh, is providing data to product teams or maybe to the finance team or the marketing team. Um, and those teams are each writing data into the data platform. So our product team here, uh, they are trying to build something for the market on the left for their customers. Um, so those customers are going to use that product or service. Um, and the product team wants to learn about how users are interacting with their service and they want to build product for them and they want to iterate quickly, right? So they're logging data about the product into the data platform. So this could be things like feature data. Uh, it could be uh, things that they are going to use later for analysis to understand, you know, maybe A-B test results or, you know, how are their users interacting with the product and, and how could they make the product better. And as they improve the product, um, they're going to be uh, making changes to the way they log that data. So they might be making schema changes. They might change what's in, inside a JSON blob. They might change event names, et cetera. Um, but our product team is moving fast. They're iterating quickly and they're building something great for the customers on the left. Um, but they're not the only team that's going to use that data. Uh, we also have a whole bunch of other teams at the company. They're also using the data platform, right? So I mentioned marketing, I mentioned finance. Maybe we have a growth team. Uh, maybe there's a security team even that's looking at all this data that we're logging and making sure that we don't have any sort of compliance risk. Um, so let's say the marketing team is going to consume information about the product and understand, you know, which campaigns should we be running or what types of features uh, could we be working into those campaigns? Um, or where should we be thinking about uh, how to change our, uh, our marketing messaging? Finance obviously needs to know what product usage might look like. Um, that may impact the way that, um, you know, they are planning for paid features or things like that. Regardless of what they're doing, all these different teams are consuming data that the product team's putting out. Each of these teams is probably also putting out some of their own data into the data platform. We're really just focusing on the product team here, um, but we've got a bunch of different uh, constituent teams. They're all putting data into the data platform. They're all reading it back out. They might be doing transformations in there. So the data platform really is sort of this beating heart of data um, inside the company. But we have all these different groups uh, working on the data platform and they have slightly different needs. So the product team wants to move fast. They want to iterate on the product quickly. They want to, like I said, change their logging. Uh, they may deprecate a feature that didn't work out and A-B test didn't go so well. Um, and so they need to be able to move fast. It's their data that they're logging from the, the features that they're building. Um, so their engineers want to be able to change that data sort of uh, anytime they need to. And, and they want to stay on block and, and build the best product they can. But those other teams are consuming the data that the product team's putting out. And so what they want is for the data to kind of move slowly. They would like it to be fairly stable, relatively comfortable. Um, you know, if you're going to be using data from the product team um, in uh, analytics dashboards for the growth team to understand KPIs and how the product's performing, uh, if they wake up one morning and, you know, half of their uh, their KPIs that they have in that, that dashboard don't work anymore because of a change that the product team made to the way that they're logging their data, that's not good. Um, so we have these sort of competing interests uh, going on about how we want the data to evolve, uh, what would be a breaking change, what is a non-breaking change, and that kind of puts the data platform team in a bit of a bind uh, because they're they're providing this platform of data to the entire company. They need to serve all these different teams, um, and so they're caught in the middle of these sort of competing interests, uh, and that leaves everybody kind of unhappy when when that doesn't work out well, right? So. Um, how does this work in the world of not data? So software engineering. Um, so if we look at uh, Slack, if we look at Stripe, if we look at Zoom, um, all of these companies have to have 24 seven service that they provide, right? We, we make a Zoom call at any time. We want a Stripe transaction to go through. We want our Slack messages to go through. Um, and so what they do is they measure their performance and they publish SLAs uh, about you know, what should you expect from the behavior of their software? And then they measure those and they're able to achieve, you know, stunning levels of reliability here. If you look at the uh, the screenshot of Stripe's website here on the right um, from October of last year, 99.999% uptime over the last 90 days for their API. Now, this is despite the fact that Stripe is making deployed 
code changes to that API multiple times per day. I think if I remember correctly, it was I don't know, 16 times per day or something like that. Um, so they're making very rapid changes to their service, just like those rapid changes that we saw happening inside the data platform, but they're still able to guarantee high uptime for the people who depend on that software. So how do they do that? How do they coordinate all these changes and how do they make sure that they're staying reliable the, the, the whole time? So uh, the answer is with SLAs or, you know, obviously there's a lot of work that goes into making this happen, but SLAs are sort of a key piece of that picture. So to talk about SLAs, we need to kind of break them down a little bit into their constituent pieces and, you know, SLIs, SLOs, SLAs, it's a lot of acronyms, but we're going to go through these three different pieces that come together to form the SLA and they help the data platform team and all of those other teams working on the data platform to coordinate uh, and keep data reliable, even when it's changing rapidly. So let's start unpacking those. So uh, SLIs all the way on the left, uh, that's what we're going to talk about first. So SLIs help us measure what's happening inside our data. Uh, and then our SLOs in the middle help us set targets for the performance of those different attributes that we might care about. And then finally, we're going to talk about SLAs. And that's how we package it all together into sort of one contractual agreement that explains what a team should expect uh, about data that is being you know, consumed out of the data platform. So let's start with the SLI. So uh, why would we need uh, an SLI or why would we need to measure all these different things in our data? Well, the answer is because without all those measurements, uh, this is how uh, data problems or, or you know, breaking changes in the data tend to get detected. Uh, they get detected because some poor data engineer gets a, a stream of Slack messages that tell them, hey, my data is broken. Um, you know, please help me fix it, et cetera. And then that, that turns into a back and forth question a lot of the time about like, well, what exactly is broken? You know, is that actually broken or do you just expect something about the data that's not really true? Um, this can be super time consuming. It often means that somebody goes into a meeting and now there's no, you know, uh, there, you don't, you lose that synchronous conversation. Um, so th this really devolves and slows down the process of doing anything about it or even on, you know, understanding if it's a real issue or just a, a difference in expectations or, or what people think is true about the data. So we solve this with SLIs. Uh, an SLI is a service level indicator. Uh, and what it is, is it's a specific descriptive measurement of the data in, in a quantified way. So it's going to be a, an actual statistical measurement or, you know, some sort of a, a metric or account. Um, and what we do is we set uh, criteria for that that tells us whether that is healthy or not. Um, and we agree on that definition. Um, so as an example here, we might look at the duplicate rate of user records um, in our users table. So we might say that uh, we're going to measure the rate of duplication of user IDs. That's something that we care about. That's something that the people who use this table, our users table care about. Um, and what we're going to do is we are going to guarantee that the percent of records in that table that are duplicated, uh, so there's just more than one instance of them, uh, is going to be less than 0.25%. We're going to measure that within any one of our date partitions. You know, maybe this is a very large table, so it's partitioned out by date. You know, we might be on um, a Hive or something like that. Uh, and we're going to measure this over the trailing 28 date partitions. We may not, it may not be feasible to measure this, you know, repeat, repetitively for the entire table, um, but we're going to look at it over the last 28 date partitions. And we're going to compute this percentage within each date partition. And we're just going to look at the count of distinct records divided by the count of all records. And that's going to tell us um, our duplicate rate. Um, so there might be other ways to measure duplicate rate, but this is an example of how we might agree on the measurement duplicate rate internally at the data platform team that we work on. Um, now on the right, we've got a couple other examples of things that you might want to create service level indicators to measure. So the freshness of the data set, when, when did we see a, a record written to it most recently? Um, duplicate rate, like we just talked about. Nulls and blanks. So how often do we not have a value or do we have a, an empty string or something like that? Um, out of ranges. So maybe we expect uh, a list of enumerated values, or maybe there's a fixed numerical range, um, malformats. So if we're you know, supposedly writing a UUID and we see integers 
maybe that's a problem. Um, so these are just a few examples of things that you could define service level indicators for. Um, but the, uh, the point here is that we can build up this body of service level indicators, and that helps us avoid that Slack conversation um, by saying, hey, here are the measurements about our data in a clearly quantified fashion. And then here are the targets for those that tell us whether that's you know, normal or not. So in this case, uh, it's okay if there are a few duplicate user IDs, maybe that's, you know, it's acceptable or it happens and, and we're all okay with that, but only a quarter of a percent. If we go up to one or 2% um, duplicated UUIDs, that's that's going to cause a problem for somebody, maybe finance, maybe for a an, an ML model that needs to consume data about our users to, um, to train, um, et cetera. So we just talked about SLI. So that's our, our sort of first of these three concepts. And that helps us quantify what we're going to measure um, that indicates whether our data is behaving in a reliable fashion or not. So now the next piece is the SLO. So now that we have these quantified measurements, what we need to do is, is say, within what tolerances do we expect those to be true? Um, now, an obvious question here might be, why not just 100%? Why can't we have that duplicate rate be less than a quarter of a percent? 100% of the time, um, always true, data is never broken, you know, life is great. Um, the answer is because if we were to set our targets at 100%, we'd have to basically freeze all changes in our code base. So we couldn't uh, onboard new data sets, we couldn't change out infrastructure for you know, different formats or newer versions of things to get performance improvements. We couldn't make changes to our upstream uh, applications that are emitting the source data. We couldn't onboard new third-party data sources. Um, we'd just have to freeze our entire data platform um, in place because each one of those changes introduces some chance of breaking something. Um, so to have 100% reliability, we can have 0% sort of, you know, evolution in our, our data platform. And, and obviously that's not feasible, right? So what are we going to do instead? We're going to set targets for each of those SLIs. And we're going to say, hey, this is an objective, a service level objective for that service level indicator. And in this case, we're looking at an objective for our duplicate rate SLI. And we're aiming to be 99.5% reliable on that particular measure of data quality. So what we're going to do to measure this and aim for 99.5% is we're going to check that SLI, uh, our duplicate rate SLI. So remember that we want the duplicate records to be under a quarter of a percent. We're going to measure that every 30 minutes on an ongoing basis. And we're going to track our 30 minute uh, recordings of that over 30 days. And over that trailing 30 day window, we can have up to 3.6 total hours in which that SLI was not being met. So what this means is over roughly the last month, our data team has said it is okay for our duplicate rate to be above a quarter of a percent. That would be an outage situation um, for up to 3.6 hours. Um, and if we, if it is in the sum of over that last month, if it's the total amount of uh, outage that we had was over 3.6 hours, then we haven't met our commitment to the company in terms of the reliability of that data set. So if we had a huge number of dupes going to that table because of, let's say, a problem with an ETL job um, and nobody noticed it for 12 hours, then we are obviously way over our, our service level objective on duplicate rate. And that would mean that we've failed our commitment to the rest of those teams that depend on our users' data. And they would you know, rightfully be upset about that. So some other options for service level objectives, and of course these, you know, you can define them to be whatever you want, but some, some common examples here on the right would be three nines, 99.9%. .9%. So over that trailing 30 day window that we chose for our example, that would be 43 minutes of downtime. 99.5% uh, would be 3.6 hours. That's what we used in this example. Two nines, 99% uh, would be 7.2 hours of downtime. So now the data team's got a little bit more breathing room. 95% um, reliability would be a day and a half. So this is this is probably something that's not super important. Um, it's okay if it's completely you know unusable for for a day and a half total over the last month, um, or 90%, three days of downtime. Um, so if this is uh, something that um, I mean, at this point, maybe it shouldn't be in an SLA uh, at all. I, I might argue three days of downtime is pretty bad uh, for a data set. But um, these are some other examples of where you could set service level objectives. And setting a stricter service level objective is making a stronger commitment to the people who depend on that data set to say, hey, this really is not going to be broken 
um, if it is only for a very short period of time. 43 minutes over 30 days means that every single day you could basically have this SLI, uh, SLA, SLI uh, violated for it. Let me, let me try that again. That means that over the last 30 days, you could have this SLI violated for roughly one minute per day. I'd say most people would, would be okay with that for things like, say, an analytics dashboard. All right, so now we know what we're going to measure in our data, and we have set reliability targets for each one of those individual measurements. Um, so now what about the SLA, the last piece? Um, so we're going to talk about an SLA for our users table following the example that we've been using for our SLIs and SLOs. So first, um, to talk about an SLA, we, we now have all these different measurements. We have targets for our measurements. Now, why, why do we need an SLA? What's this last piece? Uh, so the last piece is designed to help uh, Jerry here, uh, who is our VP um, at uh, of growth at BigCo. Um, and Jerry is upset with Eric, who leads the data team. Uh, and he said, hey, my team is having a hard time because the data is constantly broken. What is the data team doing about this? Um, so I've certainly been on the receiving end uh, of this type of an email or had it forwarded to me. Maybe some of you have as well. Um, so what does an SLA help us with? It helps us make a commitment to Jerry about uh, how reliable the data is going to be and what's going to happen if it isn't. Uh, so SLA stands for service level agreement and the agreement is the keyword there. So remember that we had SLIs, which are our indicators. We had SLOs, which are our objectives for those indicators. And now we have the agreement. So this is actually team to team. We're making a human commitment um, about process. Um, and in this example, we're creating an agreement for our DIM user table. So remember, we were tracking the duplicate rate of user UUIDs, and we wanted that to be uh, within a 99.5% tolerance. Um, and what we're going to commit to Jerry is just one level of reliability less than that. So in this case, 90% uh, instead of 99.5%. Um, and what we're telling him is we're going to measure the duplicate rate um, and we're going to aim for 90% uh, over the last trailing uh, 30 days that we will meet that duplicate rate SLI. So that gives us up to 7.2 hours of downtime over the last 30 days. And if we exceed that, what we're going to do is we're going to stop all changes to the following list of ELT jobs that feed the DIM user table, and we're going to stop changes to all upstream services X, Y, and Z. And we know that those are upstream dependencies that flow down into our DIM user table. Um, so what this does is it says, hey, Jerry, in order to guarantee your team 90% uptime on the DIM user table and make sure that you don't have duplicates, we're going to need this commitment with uh, being able to stop changes to our data infrastructure and to be able to stop upstream changes from the team that records user signups or user account changes or all these other sort of dependencies that flow into that DIM user table. Because at the end of the day, as a data engineer, if the upstream teams change things without letting me know or without us coordinating that change and how it's going to impact the DIM user table, there's not really anything I can do about it. Those changes are going to cascade down and they're going to impact the reliability of my table. So the SLA allows us to create a cross-team agreement that says, if this impacts the table, that's going to hurt Jerry's team. Our growth team is really important to us. So we need this agreement in place to say, if we violate this downtime, then we're going to force all these uh, changes to stop. So that means no new code there, no new code to the ALT jobs until we get the problem solved. And then it may also stipulate additional actions like we're going to have a P0, um, at least one P0 priority item uh, on our roadmap for this quarter about addressing this and preventing this from happening again in the future. Um, it may include any things that you agree to with those other teams, but the idea here is to say, if we exceed our service level objectives um, and we are now out of bounds, so we've caused more than 7.2 hours of downtime for Jerry's team, this is what's going to happen by these individuals. Um, and what you can even do is say, hey, look, if there's disagreement here about whether the downtime is merited or not, um, then that's going to escalate to the VP of uh, infrastructure and that they'll be the person who decides. Um, in the case of a disagreement. But the point here is that the service level agreement takes that bundle of measurements and targets that we have, and it puts human action uh, associated with those if they're not being met. And so that's why the service level agreement is a critical piece. 
So we've covered uh, SLIs, which are our measurements. We've covered SLOs, which are our targets for those measurements. And we've covered our SLA, which is our agreement across teams to say, hey, the product team, you know, they're changing their data frequently, but we know that the growth team depends on that for making decisions about advertising spend or user referrals or other things that are worth a lot of money to the business. We need to guarantee a certain level of reliability for the growth team. And we have this agreement in place so that if that reliability is broken, then we're going to work together with the product team um, until we get the problem solved. And then we're going to take preventative action to make sure it doesn't happen again next time. And we can make that commitment clearly to Jerry. And so that way he and his team feel better that they have some protections in place that they can get their work done um, without getting impacted by data reliability issues. So what does that help us do? Um, well. Going down a list of things that we might want. Um, number one, who's reporting issues to us? So we looked before um, at that uh, screenshot from Slack. Um, we don't want issues reported by our users. Without SLAs in place, we don't have measurements for what an issue even is. So it turns into this you know, manual conversation. We don't want reports from users. We really want reports from monitoring systems. We want reports from alerting, things that can just tell us objectively, this is happening, this is not what was agreed to, or this is not what we expect from the data. Somebody can just start taking action on it immediately. This is how things work in, in SRE and DevOps. You know, We don't sit down and argue about, like, is the service unavailable or not? We just have uh, measurements for it collected by machines. So that's SLAs helps us move in that direction. Number two. How are the problems defined? So again, like, is this defined by a back and forth subjective conversation with an analyst on the growth team about what is right or wrong in the data? Um, or did we have a, an agreement up front, maybe with some degree of research into, hey, this is what we can and cannot actually expect about the data. It is reasonable to expect a low rate um, or a close to zero rate of user ID duplicates. So we're going to make that commitment and it's encoded in an SLI and an SLO. Um, so moving to SLAs helps us get clarity around what exactly is a problem. What does that mean? If it's, you know, 0.1% duplicates and the analyst says, hey, this is a problem, you know, that's not a problem that we agreed to when we defined the SLI. So maybe you're wrong. If you think that you're, uh, that you're right anyway, then we need to have a conversation about changing the SLI. So this helps create structure around our conversation across borders about what to and not to expect about the data. Number three, uh, who is the response defined by? Um, so, you know, I say which VP is involved, um, you know, kind of jokingly, but uh, there's some grain of truth here. If somebody, you know, who has a lot of money riding on their team's work uh, is upset because the data is not reliable, it's reasonable that uh, the business is going to try to react to that very rapidly, right? Um, but uh, what we would prefer to have is a, a something structured in place that says that the VP doesn't need to send an email in the first place. There's an agreement there that says when these criteria are breached, then these teams are going to spring into action and they're going to take remediation against it. And they don't need to send an email. They already know that that agreement is there. They might get a response from those teams that says, hey, th there was a breach in the SLA. This is what we're doing about it. There's this P0 item on our roadmap. And so they're getting a push communication from those teams instead of having to yell about it. And finally, velocity and reliability. So th this is the whole point of SLAs. If we remember back at the beginning, we were talking about Stripe, how they're able to deploy to their API multiple times per day um, while still maintaining four nines of reliability. Um, so they have good velocity and that's great. Um, but in a world without SLAs, we may have so much velocity that our reliability is terrible. Um, and that's a problem because it means that all of those downstream teams consuming from the data platform don't know if the data is going to break at any given moment. They're afraid to build something that's really important on top of it. We can't use data in really, really critical use cases for the business if we don't know that we can expect it to, to be online all the time. So in a world with SLAs, what we're going to do is we may take a hit on velocity, but that's in exchange for being able to guarantee a reliability level that lets us actually use data in a meaningful way for the business. If that reliability is guaranteed to be at least this, this level that we've committed to as a group, then subject to that constraint, we can iterate on our, our logging or on our event names or on our ELT pipeline as fast as we want, because we have that guardrail there that's telling us, hey, here are all these measurements. And if these start going out of bounds, something is wrong. You need to slow down and stop until we get things under control again. And so that balance of reliability and iteration speed on the data team and, and the software engineering teams, that puts our velocity in a place where the business can get more done because we're moving as fast as we can knowing that what the work that we do is able to be used in high pressure situations if we needed to. 
So that's SLAs, SLIs, and SLOs for data platform teams. Thanks for listening, and I'm happy to take questions now.